This week, we're facing a brand new ice age in Frostpunk, a brand new city building survival hybrid that will chill you to your bones. And with Detroit Become Human looming just over the horizon, it's time to revisit Johnny's interview with David Cage from a little while ago. This is Player Attack. Hi, I'm Jessica Citizen, and this week, 15 people have been arrested and fined a total of $5.1 million for their part in developing hacks for PUBG. All 15 of the arrests took place in China, while other suspects are being investigated. The criminals reportedly created their own hacks, as well as hosting and selling third-party efforts. The most concerning of the lot is a Trojan horse found embedded in a widely distributed program, which Chinese authorities explain can be used to control users' PCs, scan their data, and extract information illegally. Put simply, people were paying good money for illegal software that then wreaked havoc on their own machines and stole their data. With hacking and cheating still running riot throughout PUBG, the developer has promised it will continue to crack down on hacking and cheating programs and their creators with the aim, of course, a totally fair environment for everyone. Following on from last week's story out of the Netherlands, the Belgian Gaming Commission has also ruled that in-game microtransaction loot boxes meet the definition of a game of chance. Specifically looking at Overwatch, Star Wars Battlefront 2, FIFA 18 and CSGO, a team of engineers, lawyers and IT specialists from the Gaming Commission has determined that paying loot boxes are games of chance and if those are further exploited, the game is breaking the law. Because, obviously, the problem is far more widespread than just the four games the Commission looked at, the official response is to issue a number of recommendations to policymakers, game manufacturers, game platforms, and even license providers such as FIFA, calling upon them to stop the spreading loot box epidemic. And in more fun legal dramas, the Norwegian Consumer Council is reporting that four online gaming platforms breach European consumer law. Steam, Origin, the PlayStation Store and the Nintendo eShop have all been mentioned, predictably over issues surrounding the right of withdrawal. It's the same sort of thing that got Steam in trouble with the Australian consumer watchdog last week. European gamers were being actively prevented from cancelling their pre-orders on the Nintendo eShop, with the Norwegians also finding that Steam, Origin and the PlayStation Store all claim to be exempt from the right of withdrawal, denying European gamers the statutory right to cancel a purchase. The official statement from Finn Lutzalholm Mirstad, Director of Digital Services at the Consumer Council, explains that digital purchases do not exist in a lawless vacuum and these companies must adhere to all applicable laws. The report also highlights a lack of clarity by the four gaming platforms. Earlier correspondence with Nintendo asking the company to comply with European law and change its cancellation policy has reportedly gone nowhere, prompting the Consumer Council to file a formal complaint about the eShop, Steam, Origin and PlayStation Store. Tune in next week to find out who else is cracking down on online retailers. In quick news, even though the brand new God of War is smashing records all over the place, the team at Sony Santa Monica is far from resting on its laurels. The game has already been patched up to version 1.12 and the latest update brings with it one oft-requested feature. Simply put, you can now adjust the size of the on-screen text. You're welcome. Zelda Breath of the Wild is officially the best-selling Zelda game of all time, but only if you don't count remasters. It has sold nearly 8.5 million copies on Switch and 1.5 on Wii U, adding up to almost 10 million units worldwide, putting it comfortably ahead of previous record holder Twilight Princess, which sold 8.85 million copies across GameCube and Wii, but then Twilight Princess HD also sold 1.23 million on Wii U, so that's just over 10 million units sold in total. But then, things get even more interesting when you look at Ocarina of Time. The original release is languishing with a mere 7.6 million units sold on the Nintendo 64, but it saw 4 million sold on 3DS, bringing the total to a massive 11.6 million, putting it firmly in the lead. And sticking with Nintendo, new cardboard project Labo launched last week, and while it's certainly a conversation starter, it doesn't seem to be quite the sales boost the publisher was expecting. In its first week on sale, Labo sold just 30% of its initial shipment in Japan and sales of the Switch console actually decreased week on week. 
On one hand, Big N could have simply shipped more than required to avoid the empty shelf problem it's seen with recent releases, but on the other, maybe those new cardboard bits and pieces aren't selling quite as well as expected. It's been less than two years now since the launch of Battlefield 1, but already EA and DICE have announced the game's monthly update service will cease in June. As a bit of a last hurrah, the developer is releasing a brand new mode for the game, Shock Operations, before the shutdown, which will introduce a new fast-paced 40-player control sector map. But after that, there won't be much attention being paid to the game. That said, with EA all but announcing a brand new Battlefield will be on show at E3, you won't have to wait too long to find out what DICE has been up to. And finally this week, let's talk NetHack. The game has just been updated to version 3.6.1, which fixes a large number of issues that slipped into 3.60. The dev team has also announced that 3.6.1 is the final official 3.6 version of the game, barring some sort of major issue that requires a new release. But I mean, games get updated all the time, so why is this one so important? Because NetHack, an open source dungeon crawler, is more than 30 years old. Version 3.2.2 was released in May 1996. It was updated a few times over the next two decades, with the 3.6.0 version released in December 2015. And while this one is just a maintenance release, fans of the game should take note. A bunch of platforms will be dropped from the game by the time the next update rolls around. Specifically, the following machines will no longer be able to play any version of NetHack after 3.6.1. Amiga, Atari, Macintosh Classic, BEOS, OS2, 16-bit MS-DOS, and anything requiring floppy disk support. We're not suggesting it's time to update your gaming rig by any means, just that maybe it's time to start making alternative arrangements if you want to keep playing. For more information on any of these stories, or to keep up to date with the latest gaming news, head to playerattack.com. But for now, stick around, we've got plenty more still to come. So tell me, do you want to build a snowman? Or would you rather build the last bastion of humanity at the end of the world as the planet plunges into an ice age? And you've only got late 1800 steam technology to hold back the snow. When we end up with next to nothing. We don't do what we believe is right. But we believe what we do will make us right. It is not shelter nor food that brings us consolation. This hope that makes us grow. Frostpunk is technically a city builder in that you need to sort out the housing, food and power needs of your handful of survivors. But it is the survival side of the game that provides the real challenge. The temperature starts out well below zero and drops even lower over time, which makes it harder to provide livable housing, harder to grow the food you need and harder to keep everything warm and cozy. Unlike other city builders, which tend more towards freeform, endless building, Frostpunk has a handful of scenarios providing specific challenges. The first scenario, which you'll need to beat to unlock the next, is also probably the best, as it's pretty much a straight up race against an incoming storm. Things start out fairly simple, as each scenario has a few piles of junk conveniently lying around the crater surrounding your central generator, getting you started with some wood, some metal, and some coal. Tell your people to wade into the snow and bring materials back to your storage tent and they'll trudge off. Before you start building streets and heaters, they will actually forge paths through the snow on their way to gather materials, and these tracks will fill up with snow over time. And that's basically all I've ever wanted in a city builder. Anyway, once you've got a few tents set up, a medical facility, maybe a hunting lodge and a cookhouse to provide some food, you're ready to tackle the larger challenge of building a sustainable settlement. To get started, you'll want a workshop, as that is where all your research happens. Now, you have to make some tough choices here, as getting better generators and heaters will doubtless help in the long term, as the cold is a constant threat. But in the short term, you'll want a beacon, allowing you to scout the wasteland beyond the city. You'll want a hothouse to grow your own food, and you'll probably want a coal mine to, you know, mine coal. 
everything that provides heat requires coal in increasingly greater amounts. If you build too many steam hubs or run the heaters 24-7, you might run out of coal, causing your central generator to shut down. Now, it does so gracefully, cooling off over time, which gives you a chance to shut off some heaters to lower your fuel usage or to ramp up your production if possible. This desperate hunger for coal can be relieved somewhat by researching efficiency technologies, but there are also alternative means of generating coal, including a coal thumper, which, well, it's fracking, okay? The world's already ended, it's fine. Alongside the research system, there is a choice of various laws to enact. Want to put the children to work? You can do that. Provide palliative care to gravely ill people or chop off frostbitten limbs and replace them with prosthetics? There's a series of choices where enacting one option may lock you out of others. You can't change an enacted law and you have to live with the consequences, good or bad. Later, you might even need to choose between becoming a police state to keep the peace or a non-denominational religious one. There are no best choices here, although the game itself might judge you more harshly if you choose the morally problematic options. Children really shouldn't be working in the coal or logging industries, but desperate times can call for desperate measures. In between all the building, researching and law bringing, you'll send scouts out into the frozen wasteland surrounding your settlement. Points of interest on the map can be explored, revealing stashes of supplies or fellow survivors, or some complex moral decisions. Do you bring six survivors back where they'll clog your medical centres before maybe getting better and lending a hand, or do you leave them to die and take all their stuff? If you see a group of survivors on the map, you can send your scouts out to intercept, bringing them in a lot faster. If you're in the middle of a labour shortage, this is great, but if you don't have any food or material to build new shelters, you can probably leave them out there a little bit longer. Each scenario has a different end goal. The main storyline has you try and survive an epic storm that rolls in after about a month. Before the storm arrives, you'll need to recall your scouts and outpost teams, removing that source of materials. Once the storm arrives, your hothouses and hunter cottages will shut down, meaning no more raw food coming in you'll need to have enough rations stockpiled to see you through. Coal production will continue, at least to begin with. You'll want an updated generator, heaters and steam hubs to fend off the coal, so it is a good idea to have a huge coal stockpile ahead of time, especially as the cold can eventually cripple your coal mines as tunnels collapse and machinery freezes. Even with enough coal to burn, the temperature can get as low as minus 100 degrees Celsius, which is almost impossible to make comfortable for people in their own homes, much less their workplaces. If you haven't been researching the heating technologies, you probably haven't even made it this far, as everyone would have frozen to death two weeks earlier. And that is the brilliance of steampunk. What seems like trivial choices early on can lead to utter ruination or a mad scramble to get everything done in time. It can be tough deciding whether to save some refugees when your existing population is struggling, but those tough choices have to be made by someone. And then at the end of the game, you're treated to a lovely time lapse of your city being built with overlaid text judging you for all the children smashed by your coal frackers. You monster. Oh my goodness gracious, let me tell you the news. My head's been wet with the midnight dew. I've been down on my bended knees, talking to the man from Galilee. He spoke to me in a voice so sweet, I thought I heard a shuffle of angels' feet. He called my name and my heart stood still, when he said, man, go do my will. Go tell that long-tongued liar, go and tell that midnight rider. Tell the rambler, the gambler, the backbiter, tell them the God's gonna cut them down. Tell them the God's gonna cut them down. Don't come any closer or I'll jump! Hi, Daniel. My name is Connor. There's no way out, Daniel. The only question is whether or not you take another innocent life. I'm holding all the cards. If I die, she dies. Look what you did. You were designed to serve humans, not kill them. What was I designed to be? Their slave? Their toy? You're a machine you have to obey. Now put the gun down and let the hostage go. I've spent my life taking orders. Now it's my turn to decide. Did 
Detroit is a neo-noir thriller set in the near future in the city of Detroit. And we came here to E3 to um, show the first playable scene that we revealed. You remember maybe we announced the title at Paris Games Week last November, uh, introducing the character of Kara. And now we introduce another playable character because there are more than one playable characters in this game. And uh, his, his name is Connor and he's a deviant hunter. just wanted to show how the game plays because that's so often the question we get from people. It's a great story, but how does it play? Well, we came here to show. And one of the things I got from the presentation was this really, because you said yourself, neo-noir, a really cool Blade Runner vibe to it. And as we all know, Blade Runner has about a million different endings, depending on which cut you get. So we can expect a branching narrative in this one as well. Oh yeah, we want to create the game with the most branching narrative we've ever created at the studio. So our goal is really to turn the player from an actor to the co-writer of the story somehow. Like depending on the choices you make, uh, the story will take different shapes and you will actually tell your own story as you play and, and see where it leads you. So basically every choice comes riddled with anxiety. Absolutely, there's a lot of pressure on the player, especially as all characters can die, uh, I was, I was, as was the case on Heavy Rain, if you remember. Oh, and it's exactly the same idea here, all the characters can die, so you'd better pay attention. This is on the PS4, and you guys have always been known for gorgeous fidelity in your games. How was it working with the PS4 architecture from the ground up with this one? It was definitely much easier than PS3, to be honest with you. Uh, yeah, and for Detroit, we have um, developed an entirely new engine. So it's not the engine that we've used in the past for, for either PS4 title or even for the Dark Source for a demo that we presented. It's a brand new engine because we wanted, we wanted a higher uh, fidelity and we wanted a higher sense of cinematography. So we have developed tons of features regarding lighting and, and uh, what we call physically based shaders, uh, the integration of the, the the characters in the set, the shadows, um, the bokeh, the depth of field, uh, physical cameras, I mean tons of stuff that no one cares about actually, <laughs> but it's, it's actually what helps us to create a game that looks as real as possible. Touch him and I kill you! You can't kill me! I'm not alive! Connor, how does he differ from Kara? You know, androids are really designed for a very specific task. And uh, Connor is a very advanced prototype uh, that was designed to help human investigators uh, working on cases involving deviant androids. So he's uh, equipped with some very cool features that are really exclusive to this character, like he can analyze a crime scene, he can recoup eviden evidence, he can really uh, detect things that only he can see, he can rebuild the trajectory of a bullet based on ballistics, well he can do tons of very cool stuff. So. Uh, but he's just a machine, right? He's not a deviant himself. Uh, he's uh, really a deviant hunter. So he's really cold, but very clever, very smart. Uh, and his only thing that the only thing he has in mind is uh, to accomplish his mission. I trust you. Lie to me, Connor. You lie to me. My name is Connor. This is our story. Can you hear me? Yes. ID. KPC 897504C. Can you move your head?
Your eyes now. Cervical and optical animation checked. Now give me your initialization text. Hello. I'm the third generation AX400 Android. I can look after your house, do the cooking, mind the kids. I organize your appointments. I speak 300 languages and I am entirely at your disposal as a sexual partner. No need to feed me or recharge me. I'm equipped with a quantic battery that makes me autonomous for 173 years. Do you want to give me a name? Yeah. From now on, your name is Kara. My name is Kara. I never thought that technology was something necessary in order to create emotions. I mean, look at Pixar, for example. They create, with great technology, it's true, but they create plastic toys that were very emotional. So having ultra-realistic characters is, is something you can do, and it's the di direction we chose, but it's not, it's not something absolutely necessary. But, yeah, for Detroit, we wanted this realistic feel uh, because the, we want to give a, uh, the feeling that this world is, really, is real. And uh, so this technology really helped us in creating this feeling. You've been gone for two weeks, so the place is a mess. You do the housework, the washing, you cook the meals. That's Alice. You look after her. Homework, bath, all that crap. Got it? Right away, Todd. Was there a reason you specifically went for Detroit? I was fascinated by this city, by the history of the city. Uh, it's been an industrial giant in the 20th century. Then it went through hard times uh, at the beginning of 2000. And now it's trying to, to rebuild and really to, to... There's a lot of energy there, uh, a lot of people struggling and fighting to make this city great again. And there are some incredible places there. Um, so I was fascinated by the history, by the story of this city that was very human by itself. But at the same time, I didn't want to write about Detroit from Paris. I needed to go there. And uh, so we traveled there and of course, we explored and we, we saw the, the abandoned factories and the abandoned churches that, that people talk about. But at the same time, we met some incredible people and we could really feel the vibe of, of energy and, and um, this desire to, to make this city great again. It, it was really, really strong. And I thought it was the perfect background for, for the story I wanted to tell. So a story about androids is really a human story at its heart then? That's for me the most important thing. I didn't want to tell another story about machines and technology and AI. I mean, it's been done before. Uh, I, I'm, in all my work, I've always been very interested in, in the human aspect um, of the characters and the stories. So, um, yes, I'm using androids in this case, but it's maybe to better talk about us, the uh, humans. How did you feel about the reaction it got at the conference? Because I was sitting there and as it came up, people just were a mix of awe and also excitement. I was uh, really surprised, to be honest, because when you come to E3, and we work in isolation for almost two years on this thing, so the first time you reveal your work, you never know what to expect and will people like it. And it's like your baby, so it's the first time you show it to, to, to people and you just want everybody to, to like him or her. And um, so we were incredibly pleased uh, with the feedback we got so far. Um, only very positive feedback and reactions. Uh, we got some people who said, well, this trailer is in CG, and actually we're great to show that it's running on a PS4 here. So uh, no, only very good feedback and very pleased to see that people are actually eager to play this game and, and were impassioned to see what Quantic Dream was working on. My name is Kara. I am one of them. This is our story. And that's about it for this edition of Player Attack. Thanks for watching. Next week, the two-hour team check out Roguelite Heroes of Hammerwatch to find out if it's worth your hard-earned money. But if you'd prefer something in the real world, we're also doing some train spotting with a look at the best transport sims on the market. 
In the meantime, you can catch us at playerattack.com. We're on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. And if you've got something you want to say, send us an email, mailbox at playerattack.com, or just hop on our forums. Also, if you want to support Player Attack, you can find us on Patreon and help us bring you the latest in gaming news, plus all these wonderful interviews and reviews from the world of video games. Till next week, I'm Jessica Citizen, and this is Player Attack.